Hey everybody, I'm Jordan Tenenbaum, the social media manager at Saligo. I'm joined as always by my co-host, Mark Simon, our vice president of strategy, uh, as well as JW Kim, um, the ex-head of design for Capital One, who's currently working at EX Squared. Welcome to the show, JW. How are you doing today? Uh, good, good. Really good. It's a Friday, um, so looking forward to the weekend. Lots of work, obviously, but still. yeah. Nice, nice. Well, I'm glad, that you're, in a, glad you're in a good mood and it's great to have you on. <laughs> Um, JW, I thought we could kind of uh, introduce the audience to you if they're not sure exactly who you are. But could you tell us just like a little bit about your story? I know um, you started off as yeah. an engineer, uh, acclaimed, yeah. quote, not so good engineer, um, even though I think yes. you were probably pretty good. Um, but how'd you get from uh, engineering into the design world? Tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, to tell that story, I have to go way back. Uh, but since, uh, you know, this is a podcast, uh, I, I think we have a little bit of time. But um so my journey in design started when i was in third grade i would say um i grew up in a british colony called brunei it's in southeast asia mm -hmm. my parents are korean uh the most memorable class was an art class in third grade and after third grade they stopped uh the art education for me and so then i i did what was natural for me which was like more math i i didn't like to memorize things so i didn't take the literature route i took more the math route then so proceeded to do electrical engineering robotics to be more specific because i like to work with my hands uh wasn't that great uh uh in school and and that was in korea and and then i was looking at the environmental problem uh and this was the 90s late 90s so and I thought like, hey, I, I used, I love nature. I, I was sailing at that time. And um, and I decided to do a master's in environmental engineering. And then when I, I came here to the US for that, and what I realized was that environmental engineering was really not about prevention, but taking the gunk that comes out of factories and treating them as opposed to figuring out how to prevent them. So. I was super disappointed. And then I, I figured, you know what, might as well take environmental engineering, make the best out of it. So I did a master's in hybrid electric vehicles. There was a professor there that had this uh, algorithm of how to run a hybrid electric vehicle very efficiently. So my thesis was, was around comparing the environmental impact of electric, hybrid electric and normal internal combustion engines and uh, that was late 90s. I couldn't get a job, but somehow I ended up in tech because that was booming. And a few years in, I came across a company called IDEO. Somehow that felt magical. I'm not sure if you know about IDEO. And I, I just looked into how you like what kind of people were working there. And I realized, oh, it's it's there's a program in Stanford that teaches this, I go, okay, you know what? I have to go back to school for this degree. This feels like me. Uh, so that was, you know, mid thirties, uh, mid career, gave up everything, went back mm -hmm. and I've been in design since. So that, that's my journey. So it's, uh, it's been a, it's been a long ride, but you know, for me at the end of the day, fulfillment is, uh, you know, what I strive for. That's awesome. That's a really cool journey from, from Brunei all the way to uh, working um, all the way up to Capital One in, in terms of doing design. So I, I appreciate you kind of, uh, kind of, I guess, giving us that perspective. Um, in terms of design, I think that's something that we have mm -hmm. not talked about a ton on this podcast. We're typically, Mark and I are, are deep into the technical things, but you do have a technical background um, mm -hmm. and you obviously work in design. So I'm kind of curious, um, could you talk to us a little bit about your philosophy in terms of designing content around um, technical products or, or technical brands? How do, how do those two overlap? What does the Venn diagram look like? What is your philosophy um, when you're creating or designing for technical things that you know sometimes are, are, are a little bit more complex than, a, than basic design principles can handle? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if there's a like I can think of offhand like a great Venn diagram, but when I, I've been at uh, companies like Citrix where we were designing for 
very, very sort of technical crowd, if you will. And I think at the end of the day, if you abstract like what designers do, um, really you, you're trying to get down to fundamentals or first principles, if you will. Um, but I think for me, uh, for a designer in that space, you really, really have to understand a little bit of the technical side of things to do a really good job. Otherwise, then you end up just being a stylist. You know, you make things pretty or you, you become usable. So to really, really be a good designer in that space, I think you have to understand your audience, first of all, abstract what they're really trying to do. So, you know, it could be very technical, but at the end of the day, like you have to abstract, like what is their ultimate goal? Um, so that gets into research, uh, what we usually call research and design. And, you know, um, I, I would argue that for great products to be built, whether it's design, uh, design audience or non-design audience, like such as yourself, the, the critical piece is not just the designers, but the team around the designers. So, if, so I would argue that almost everyone is a designer, uh, whether you like it or not. If you look around you, everything is designed but the person making it may not know that they were designing stuff like mm -hmm. so this bookshelf obviously is designed the corners and everything like that but still that someone thought about making this corner maybe it was the designer that did it but for some things in everyday things there's a person that just made it without knowing that they were designing stuff so if you look all around this everything is designed i think the same goes for you know programming languages you know, if you want to make it easy and intuitive, the words you choose and all of that is ultimately quote unquote design. And so, so that's why I think for real strong products or services to be made, like to be produced, I think the team around the design is just as critical as the designers you have. I, I don't know if I quite answered your question, but you know, that. No, you did. That was beautiful. Yeah, and, and JW, that, that's really interesting here. That brings up a question for me, and this is coming from yeah. someone that's lived well outside of the design world and yeah. never never thinking of myself as an artist or really even creative, uh, but but yeah. realizing that there's creativity in, in a lot of things, whether it, it, it comes out that way or not. And, and for me, it brings up a question, where's the dividing line between engineering and design? Because it seems like at a certain point, they start really like inter intertwining. That, that sometimes the, the best engineering is you you have these very beautiful, like, and I'm like, well, I know there's creativity in, in engineering excellence, but how do you, where do you draw that line between those two? Ooh, um, like I, I, I'm more of a generalist, so I've been on both. So I yeah. just don't see an actual line like some people do. Yeah. Um, and so for me, like the, the best experiences I've had is where the, the engineers were pushing us on design stuff and we were pushing engineering on some engineering things. And mm -hmm. we just never really said like, this is your space, stay out, stay out of my lane and this is my space. I'm going to stay in my lane and you stay in yours. Like I almost felt like the debates we were having Again, these are not contentious, you know, like we don't throw things at each other. It's more like we know we want to make better stuff. So I don't know if there's an actual line. I, I personally am a firm believer that you like cross-functional teams, uh, product manager, you know, the trio, product manager, designer, mm -hmm. uh, engineer. Uh, I, I like them to work together from start to finish. So so everyone's a product manager everyone's a sort of a quote-unquote designer i don't think everyone can be an engineer but everyone can sort of you know push the engineer if they find something like magical that they think is great for the user you know you know sometimes you have to push technology mm -hmm. for that and so the quote from like pixar like art challenges technology technology inspires the art like i truly believe in that like so for me it's some for me the I hope there's no line, like for me personally. It's a seamless blend between the two, it sounds like. Yeah. So, yeah. So, with that in mind, um, yeah. you recently wrote a piece on Medium that I was taking a look at, and you used some language that I, I it was new to me. And so, I kind of wanted to ask you about that and, and how you define yeah. it. Um, you said that design offense is more important than design defense. Yeah. Um, 
obviously you're a fan of soccer or football. Yeah. I don't know which you call it. Um, yes. but, um, both. Okay. Good. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to offend or anything. Um, but, uh, what is, what is design offense and how, do, how does it differ from design defense? And, um, how do you kind of apply that to the work that you're doing, you know, when it's a technical product? Yeah, um, I, I'd say I think the article again, I, I didn't, haven't wrote, written uh, much articles, but this is hopefully like a start of a new year, new resolution. Um, when I see back get my career for the 20 plus years, there's probably only a couple of instances where the people around me were uh, very mature in design, if you will, uh, like engineers, I'm talking about like engineers, product managers, a lot of times, uh, most often you are working with people that either are unfamiliar with designers or they've never worked with a designer. And so when I talk about offense versus defense, I think, you know, again, being a design snob, I, I will just openly say it. Um, I, I, you know, we've had, 20 plus years since the launch of the iPhone, it's done a lot of good in terms of design. Everyone, I think, cares or understands more about design. But still, I think there's very few products out there that I go like, wow, this is great design, or they continue, continue to produce great design. And so when I talk about offense, it's more about, you know, always trying to push yourself to innovate. But at the same time, it doesn't you're not just innovating because there's new technology. You, you, it's sort of a whole package. The, the product mm. is great technology, but it's also great design. Um, you know, it's, it's a blend. And, and of course, it makes a lot of money. You know, at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're in businesses. So, so what I talk about that, like that, that sort of the thinking there, whereas design defense is, is more, Hey, we got this great idea, this new technology, or this new thing. Hey, design team, can you just kind of make this look pretty or uh, make this use, do some user testing to make sure that this is usable and just focus on this. And in that environment, design is sort of, you know, like it comes later. It doesn't come in the, in the beginning. And I remember I talked about like the team's beginning, uh, the team, like the cross-functional team being together from start to finish, like you don't see that. It's more, I got this idea, let me hash it out, and then I'm going to give it to the designers. And so in that instance, what ends up happening invariably is like there's like things that are important to the designer. Uh, we call it like the underside of the table has to be polished. You know, like even people don't see it. That's, that's sort of the quality mindset you have. Like those, you are debating about those, you know, like uh, you're debating about why you should, you're justifying as opposed to letting designers do good work there. They spend half the time like justifying. And, and so, so offense for me is like, you don't have to do that. Like you, you, you're all like wanting the best design, no matter what, and the best product. So awesome. I, I, that's how I differentiate it. It's interesting. So what companies soft maybe what specifically what software companies are embracing offensive design that you know if you can think of any off the top of your head i'm just curious um so apple i think you know like most people say would be in that category but i you know i just don't like recent years i don't think they're quite there anymore but you know used to be i'd say like the other interesting companies are like airbnb for example i think they're doing doing interesting things and there's a uh, Brian Chesky the CEO I think he he talks about like how cars are getting better every four years because of a new model but when you look at apps you know you don't see that you don't see like apps being much better after four years it's always incremental updates and it hasn't changed much since you know like whatever five years ago when it launched for example and so I think Airbnb uh, is trying to do few things, but big things every year. They're, uh, they're more on a hardware cycle, I would call it. Um, so I think that's interesting there. And then Square, I think uh, Jack Dorsey with Cash App and things like that, I think are are pushing the envelope a little bit. So um. awesome! No, that's that's uh, 
I appreciate that. It's it's kind of interesting because we work in you know Mark and I were in the software world and um, you know design manifests in content mm-hmm. and design also manifests in UI and UX. And so it's kind of interesting to hear your perspective about what other companies in a similar sphere are um, yeah. really excelling because those are all companies that are tangible. We understand Apple, we understand Airbnb, and um, f- folks like you know Mark and I. It just kind of helps. Um, put things in perspective. Um, so so ahead, in, rela- in relation to that, JW, where does where does usability come into play? And how do you think about usability as a designer or interface with usability specialists? I mean, it's a key part of design, obviously. Um, and uh, remember the, like, if the, is there a line between usability and aesthetics? And uh, my feeling is there's more overlap than there's, a line in my mind. Mm-hmm. So, um, but at the end of the day, yeah, if someone's buying a product and it's not usable, no matter how pretty it is, then you failed. I mean, <laughs> if you had to, yeah. you had to like pick pick a side, if you will. But but I think when when you have a really strong design team, you know, like what you learn in design school as a visual designer or graphic designer is like typography. Uh, typeface designing that um and you know if you if you boil down sort of the user interface into the smallest element it's words and it's letters and so so people trained in that know like you know like what words are more readable for example um but also Mm -hmm. they they can think about like what you know typefaces are better for your brand that would represent your brand if it's more modern for example i'm sure you guys went through that with the with the with your rebrand uh you know you spend countless hours like to to a lay person it's like this similar to that similar to that but to them it's not uh, to the graphic designer it's not because i don't know it's it's sort of so so back to the usability i think you know both have a huge part to play i know that wasn't the question but I think, uh, like I said, like you, you have to nail that. That's like uh, table stakes. Yeah, it feels like these things are all kind of like key legs to to a stool, so to speak. That you you, you don't you you can't you you can't remove any one of them. And if it's a really good product, they all come together seamlessly. And and right. really you don't you don't know where where you, you you don't think you don't think about those things when you use a great product whether it's software or it's a physical product i think you you're not you're you're not thinking about whether it's beautiful or if it's usable you just it's beautiful and it works and it, it solves the problem and uh you you're really unconscious to a lot of those and maybe maybe that's a sign when you've got it right yeah yeah i think yeah exactly i think best design is when you don't have to think you know it's sort of subconscious, you know where to go, what to do. If you get to that level, I, obviously the best is you don't have to tell it. It reads your mind and you're done. What <laughs> <laughs> of that is like, I process it. I mean, the, we're, we're working on a bid to, to, to win a contract. And I had to figure out an analogy of like, uh, what good design or design system, you know, design system, something that every company uses today. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a system of like buttons, you know, and, and a lot of different things, brand elements. And, uh, the metaphor I use was, is an airport, like airport is custom built. It's a, it's a hub, it's a platform, but, uh, the key thing is you're there to provide some traveler to go from point A to point B. You're just a means to an end. The end is they want to be in the Bahamas, you know, drinking Mai Tais. The airport. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. The airport is a means to an end. Like, don't get in the way of this person getting there. So how can you make it super smooth? There's a security check and all that. But when you're in a rush, I've I've had this happen to me, and it's an unfamiliar airport. The signs, you know, like that's when I think people realize the importance of hierarchy big letters versus small letters color versus non-color putting all similar stuff together like putting information together Mm -hmm. if all the arrows are pointing here put all the stuff that are related to the arrows pointing here together don't put like one there one there one there one there and you have to scan you know there's there's a lot of different things and so type hierarchy 
color, all those things come into play that are about, like you said, usability. And then if you look underneath that, it's about graphic design. Um, and um, anyway, uh, I rambled on about it, but uh, I think the airport metaphor, we'll see if it sticks. We're going to use that for, for our, uh, for our uh, uh, proposal. You know, I think it, it it's very sticky. I, I, as soon as you said that, I had a memory of probably between the ages of six and 12. Anytime I was in an airport, mm -hmm. my dad would always say, okay, Jordan, take us to the gate. And I remember trying to like read these screens okay. and look at these arrows and like, you know, he huh. just wanted to prepare me for real life and, you know, get ready to do this kind of things in the future. And I hated it because it was yeah. designed so terribly. And I never looked at it through a design yeah. perspective. But now that you say that I'm having these flashbacks of, of mm -hmm. reading the departing and arriving charts and everything looks the same. And I can't tell the difference because yeah. it's just zeros and ones and numbers and things and trying to figure out where to go. And there's a hundred different arrows pointing different directions. And I think that that is probably the antithesis of good design. And I think yeah. the more smooth and the more obvious and the less thinking that a brain has to do, the yeah. better the design it is, which is exactly what you said. And I don't know, yeah. that, that was a fantastic, very sticky metaphor. Um, yeah. And I, I even look, uh, uh, tell me if I'm, you know, if this, this topic is boring and you want to move switch to something else, but I, because of this, I even researched about like modern airport design it used to be that uh, the old design of airports is when you check in, there's a counter and the wall behind the counter is, is just dark. So you can't really see where next you have to go to. But nowadays what you see is when you walk in, the counters are sort of sideways, parallel to where you're headed. So you can see, oh, there's the, the oh. parting gates. It's more transparent. You see the planes beyond that. And so it causes less anxiety. So you use that sort of metaphor in, in a lot of websites too, right? You say, oh, here's your report and boom, you put up a, hey, sign up before you, right? Like check in before you, you, you get your report. So you, you have all these uh, sort of elements sort of, you know, play both in the offline world and, the, in, and online as well. I, I think that was fascinating. Like, you know, them kind of say, let them see the actual ultimate target uh which is the plane that you're boarding it's kind of like software companies that offer up like a, a sandbox when you're trying out a product it's like let me see it yeah. let me look look at what i'm getting to and yeah. i think that's something that i, I know saligo does we have a 30-day free trial where you can go in and build these integrations and um you know see what works and what connectors we have and connect your different applications and automate the flow of data between them and yeah i mean People want to see the destination. You know, it's kind of like imagine looking at a travel brochure and there's no pictures of of the place that you're going. It's, it's like, I, what the hell's exactly. the point? And you want to <laughs> yeah. you want to see the destination or at least get a taste of exactly. it. Exactly. Um, with it's, it's just great a great airport metaphor. I never thought we'd be talking about airports, but um, with with that in mind and, and kind of you laying out some good practices and and um, in contrast some bad practices. Um, an airport being like a real life example of real life UI and UX in the software mm -hmm. world. Um, what are some like design faux pas within UI and UX that um, you just, you know, it, it irks your brain? Cause I think Soligo is always looking to improve and I'm sure there's some little things, um, you know, here and there that just drive people nuts and we haven't heard about them and they're probably simple design changes, but maybe in the UI UX space or in general, what are, what are some faux pas that you've, you've noticed uh, across the board in, in the software space? Um, I mean, so one, one thing about design is that you're constantly looking at things and figuring out what's wrong and what's right and how to improve it. it there's no off switch, uh, at least for me, I think for a lot of friends I know who's in design is like that. <laughs> and so, but the funny thing is I, I can't like nothing comes to mind, but I, I would say this, um, like one thing that I still can't believe I have a credit card company. I don't want to like rip them because, you know, they're a credit card company uh, that I have personally, but I go to their site and, um, you know, it loads slowly. That's one like, you know, just be to load for, for one, but then it was built with this module of things where something loads here, something loads there, and then it's janky. It kind of moves like that. Um, 
And so one of the things that uh, I told like an engineer, I remember like a long time ago when we had this uh, thing we were building and everything was loading differently and uh, and I tried to click something and then it moved down because something else loaded on top of it and it, you know, like it moved it down. And so I said like, you have to think of a page loading, uh, put, a, put a sound to it, like put a sound to every little thing that's loading. And that is a, essentially visual noise. So if, a, if something is loading abruptly, like what's a, what's a good sound for that? Bump, okay. Then if something is loading slowly, but takes a long time, maybe it's like whoosh. So if you put all that together, Bump bush, like if you have a symphony of that or a cacophony of that, then then I think you can like hear what a bad design is from a loading perspective. I don't know if that makes sense, right? Like you totally. have, you have four or five engineers saying, okay, you make this sound, you make this sound, you make this sound, you make this sound. That is basically visual noise. And for a designer, because you're so in tune with you know, because your your the gift is your eye. I think you notice that more than certain people. Like for the engineer, it's like it's just loading. Who cares? You know, it's gonna load. Who cares? But for for a user, at the end of the day, if it's a banking and this is a credit card company, like it just diminishes the 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 faith I have in the system of it being secure, of it being working properly. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, if this was not a big company, it was a new new startup credit card. Like I just don't know if I want to be dealing with this. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that kind of tool would help. I think that that is one that I still feel I can't believe they're still in business, for example. <laughs> so so J JW, you're basically saying, you know, even with something like this, you know, it's a large organization, if they can't execute on a good, clean design, whether it's conscious yeah. or unconscious, uh, a user, a potential buyer, a potential client, whatever it may be, is going to have. Essentially, they're damaging their credibility by yeah. by way of that. Yeah, and and at the end of the day, you're going to have the younger companies that know this, that know like great design is about a smooth experience, a whoosh, and then it it shows up on your screen just once. Everything's there. Like they they're going to pay attention to that, and at some point, you know. You, you may get displaced by them. Interesting. It's a really it's good like not your daddy's credit card, you know, like that's the word that they're going to use. It's like, it's not my daddy's credit card. I actually had that happen to me when I was at Intuit. I can talk about Intuit kind of openly uh, as well as others, but I think uh, we had an intern come in and I was hired on to take the desktop products that was built in the 70s and they were still, you know, updating and maintaining those 70s or 80s i can't remember and we were going to SAS, and the intern comes in looks at the software and go wow that that looks like a software my dad would use horrible right a horrible thing to say yeah. it's a uh, you know I, I always describe salesforce as looking like 90s aol um yeah and maybe pre pre the update a few years ago but <laughs> It's 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 kind of that thing where it's like you just look at some software and you're you just like nope like that's not that ain't it that's not gonna work for me or my brain and I don't know it's it's just it's it's interesting to hear this from a from a designer's perspective. Um, well, I, I have one question that's uh, hopefully you feel all right at answering. Um, you used to work at Capital One. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously, a, a global brand, um, one yes. of the biggest in the world. Um, how are you able to impact the design at a brand with hundreds of thousands of employees? Like, what was your, what were you looking to achieve, and how successful were you um, in in being able to implement what you wanted to? It's such a big global brand. Yeah, and so I was the head of design for an organization called the Garage. Uh, and so my, if, if you talk about my passions, obviously one is design, the other is innovation. So innovation, like you can come at it from different angles, business innovation, tech, technology innovation, and then we come at it from a human center innovation. So, so essentially for us, uh, for me, my goal was to, and again, my, I have some 
uh, background in startup. So really taking sort of the, the scrappiness of startup mentality and uh, building some, you know, like quick sort of prototypes and concepts for the company. Um, and so I, I wouldn't say I was successful. So I, I admit that for uh, first, because at the end of the day, it's a huge, huge, huge company. Um, and so for me, what I was at least able to do was like, um, and Kendall knows this, um, we were going down the path of using a lot of illustration for our new look. And then this was a decision made before I joined. And then um, when I came in, I said like, look, we just went through a whole redesign of this small company. It's not even Capital One. Um, and as much as illustration makes sense, it's also very high maintenance. Um, if you want to then use stock illustration, then that kind of diminishes the value of it because, uh, you know, it's like the, the, the guy I see on Microsoft and Microsoft, this is a true story. Microsoft uses the same stock photo that we used <laughs> this, this African-American guy. <laughs> and so, so if you, if you're a big brand and you use the same illustration as some other company then you know it just diminishes the whole value right like i can't believe microsoft using mm -hmm. stock photos right for a company that big you should take your own photos right like that you want to talk about pet peeves just now you're a freaking <laughs> global brand and you can't even like use you can't even like spend some money finding like good stock you know like good photographers like that blows my mind and so so at the very least at capital one i i think they're gonna go away from the illustration um, that I was able to. And then second thing for me, big believer in just you, you, you lead by action. So we were able to uh, move fast uh, in certain areas. Uh, and for me, work as a team from start to finish. So we, we did a couple of projects like that. Um, hopefully that stays, but you know, you never know. Like. Yeah. Culture is such a difficult thing to change. And that's why I wrote that article. It's like, I think at the end of the day, culture um, is difficult to change. A lot of times when I have interviews or I had interviews with heads of companies or CEOs, they're wanting this design person to come in and change the culture and make design the forefront of things. And my argument to in that article that I wrote is like, I it can't it, it culture is not something that one person can do come in and do and change the ceo whoever it is has to make the change happen and and the way you do that obviously is to really know who you are and who you want to be and and then what you have to do is like for example if things are not good enough to launch and you've been a company that's been shipping every two weeks whether it's good or not but if design is at the forefront and if it's not good enough, then you have to like model that behavior. No, we're gonna, we're not gonna ship it, you know, even if it costs us revenues, right? Like you have to do the hard things, I think. Um, and so I always say you can bring in an Apple designer, the best Apple designer, bring that person to Microsoft, that person, the Apple designer more than likely are not gonna be successful just because again, it's, it's really the culture, the environment if that is not there, then it's super hard. It takes a lot to uh, to innovate. It's it's funny that you mentioned the stock photos. I um, a few years ago, I used to work at a company, and I remember I was with with a buddy of mine prospecting leads, and we we found this guy that was this white guy in a suit with a really cool haircut, and he had this big beard. And at the time, we we would just joke about how he was the epitome of like a, a tech bro, and like yeah, yeah. Two weeks later, we were researching a different company and a different photo of that same exact guy popped up. And over yeah. the next couple of months, we'd see this same guy pop up on new SaaS technology company marketing pages. And it was just like the same guy over and over, a cool looking dude with a beard and a suit. And it was just like, are, is everyone just using the same stock images? And, and and when you don't allow yourself to stand out from the crowd, it's, I don't know, it's a little embarrassing. Um, yeah. I, so, I think you call that like the, it's not a metrosexual, it's like a lumbar sexual or something like that. I can't remember. 
he, he looked he, like he would chop wood on the weekends. Yeah, I yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, I've seen those two for sure. So, so yeah, you know, that's, it's just, it's just interesting that the brands are, are still doing that. It's, it's kind of uh, mind blowing. It's amazing. I think, yeah, I think I'm in the wrong business. I, I, I may just get into a stock photo and maybe with AI, you, you, you know, you'll have more variety and stuff. And maybe that's, that's, hmm. that's the first place that, you know, you, you'll get these more on brand customized, you know, whether it's stock photos or illustration that suits you. I mean, that, that that's that something be... we've been doing. That's actually that's Kendall's great. big push recently has been creating human like, and I mean, they look really good, but they are AI generated images of, of humans that mm. truly align with kind of this new brand push and this new brand design we're going. So Kendall, if you're listening, Hey, what's up for me and JW and Mark. Um, but, uh, you're, I right, you're... one of those yesterday, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you, you, you did. I don't, did you know those were AI generated Mark? Well, not until I, I there were there was something funny about them, but until it was mentioned, it was like I was like, oh, okay, of course they are. They just yes. they were not quite they were not quite lifelike, uh, exactly. very lifelike. At the, they're not quite real, but very lifelike at the same time. Which you know, then that's that kind of summarizes it in a way. One hundred percent, and and yeah, it's it's just interesting how how technology is um, kind of like. You know AI or, or whatever it is is just influencing the future of design. Um, and, and when are you going live? I'm I'm now super curious what 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 was done. Um, our newest campaign has just launched. Until we get the whole brand, the website, and every like piece of future content, I want to say like a couple weeks. Um, you should start being able to see uh, new branding show up in quite a few different places. But until it's a hundred percent all encompassing this, uh, this excuse me, brand rollout will probably be a few more weeks for now. But, um, like I said, before the, the podcast started, we are very excited. Mark's rocking one of the new shirts, um, nice. new, font, new colors. Oh. Um, it, mm -hmm. it should be uh, pretty exciting. We cool. have about, we have about 12 minutes left. Um, I have two questions that I want to ask yeah. you, JW that are not yes. particularly designer work related. Um, Mark, I'm curious if, if you have anything that you want to ask or wrap up with before I do my due diligence. No, I, I'd actually, I, I, I love these questions. So go right ahead. These, this is the, maybe the funnest part of the whole, uh, our, our average podcast is, is when we get to these. Okay, perfect. Well, if that's the case, um, Mark, I, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, I'm going to guess that you probably wouldn't see this one coming. Um, so JW, uh, you said that you originally worked on, um, engineering in terms of hybrid electric and um hmm. uh, internal combustion engine vehicles which i'm a huge car nut so i find that interesting you also mm -hmm. said you were raised in brunei which i find mm -hmm. really interesting and if you yeah. combine those two pieces of information um the right. first thing that pops into my head is the uh, world's most expensive car collection owned by the sultan of brunei prince jeffrey that's right, that's um, right. i am when it comes to all things car related, uh, I'm obsessed yeah. with cars and car history, but the most okay. interesting, the crown jewel of my interest when it comes to this is um, the Sultan of Brunei's car collection. Um, yes. I, I actually have some friends in Jakarta who um, okay. have personal friends who were working for the Sultan of Brunei um, doing mechanical and um, all sorts of upkeep on his vehicles. I'm curious okay. if that if that uh, subject of history is of any interest <laughs> to you. To me personally, and uh, one reason I I'm, I want to ask is because for those listening, the Sultan of Brunei would contact companies like Bentley and Ferrari and Aston Martin and Rolls Royce and build custom one-off cars that the world has never seen. They are incredibly yeah. rare. Um, gold plated for some of them yep. gold plated and and some of them are just very <laughs> interesting designs or iterations of other cars uh yes. ferrari sf90 there's a whole bunch of different um you know the bentley buccaneer uh there's a whole bunch of uh, these cars that are um workshops in design and so i'm just curious if if that ever piqued your interest given your background yeah, I never was a big car guy i i like nice car i like design nice design cars uh i i still feel like the 911 for me is the like my you know like the the car targa 
for for just just because I feel like, but uh, you know you can sort of get a convertible what you're not. But I I've never really ridden in one. So I hear the the uh, ride experience is not that great. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I've never been really really a car guy myself. Uh, sorry to to say that. Now my friend, good friend I, I, like yours, he used to work for the Sultan Brunei. The garage and i one time he brought me there and I, I mean it's just it's just like long like a long just huge garage with just you know you car after car after car after car and his job was obviously he's not even to fix it he's, he's just driving it every day because he's got so many cars and you have to run oh, yeah. drive it you know drive <laughs> today i'm gonna drive the lotus tomorrow i'm gonna drive the lamborghini you know it's just pick <laughs> take a pick um Mark, plug your ears. Uh, JW, if he's hiring, please let me know. <laughs> um, yeah. No, that's that's okay. It's it's totally fine that that you are not um a car person. I just whenever I don't I don't know a ton of people from Brunei, obviously. Um yeah. and so when I heard that, it just it piqued my interest. And the fact that you were there is like mind blowing. That's a dream of well, life for me. So what do you think of the Cybertruck design wise? I'm I'm curious, like you, Jordan and Mark, like what, what do you think about? Well, let's hear Mark first. I'm oh, curious. I mean, I, I think it's horrible. I mean, oh, nothing really? short, okay. yeah, nothing short of horrible. Yeah, okay. because it's 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 design. A truck is about function, not about design. And yeah. so it's a utilitarian tool to accomplish a set of tasks. And here yeah. the design has gotten in the way of the function and actually diminishes yeah. the function. And so I think it's I think it's just terrible. It's the antithesis of what a truck is. So um yeah. Uh, you know, that's that's an opinion if you're looking for one. <laughs> Mark, Mark that. had Love that. that. Love Mark's that. had that in the chamber for months, waiting to unload. <laughs> She's um, not going to buy a cyber truck then. Okay. No, you no, know, that's not what that won't be happening. I, I think as a design exercise, it's not terrible. I think in terms of, I I actually completely agree with Mark. Like a truck is a utilitarian thing to haul stuff and go off road and tow 20,000 pounds or, you know, an RV. And um, I don't know, uh, like, again, I'm nerding out about car stuff, but like the, the Ford lightning, which is the electric F-150 recently came out. And like when you're towing anything between the extra weight and the um, aerodynamics, your battery life is cut in like half basically. Um, and I don't see it being too much different on most electric trucks. So in my opinion, electric trucks are kind of goofy to begin with, but the cyber truck, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm not a fan. It just kind of, I don't know. It looks like a, a, a stock car or not a stock car. Excuse me. You know, you know, when like you're a kid and you build those like triangle things that go down the, the racetrack, um, <laughs> like as a boy scout. It looks like one of those. Oh, it looks like a Pinewood Derby car is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, okay. Enough car talk. I want to bring and, it back. I'm, I'm, I'm with you guys. I'm not a fan either. So. Okay. Yeah. You're one of us. I like to hear it. Um, <laughs> outside of car talk, outside of uh, design and, and just work in general, I'm curious, JW, uh, I always like to humanize our guests on this podcast. And I think you've done a great job at coming across as human. Um, but what are you? What are your passions, hobbies, and interests outside of work? Tell the people what you uh, what you like to do. Yeah, so uh, snowboarding is one. Uh, so I, uh, I I'm relatively like I'm not young anymore. So I think I always <laughs> tell my wife the excuse like, "Hey, I don't have that many days left in terms of snowboarding and powder." So she lets me go. So that's great. Um, uh, but I I, I I should try that one. I, I haven't. Yeah. Exactly. I haven't, I haven't tried that, but I will. I will definitely pull that out. Okay. Because you know, you. like I think Mark, from the background check I did on you, it's like, I think we're about similar age, and so for me, it's like I have maybe ten good years where I can really enjoy it until you know I have to, like you know, take a step back a little bit. So, um, so I I recently went to Japan. Uh, tried. I used to live in Korea. They told me about Japan, but I. I just never went when I was in college, but I regret that now because Japan has the best powder. I mean, it is unbelievable. I also um, hear they have really good sushi. Oh, the food is great. And it's cheaper. <laughs> yeah. It's cheaper. It's cheaper than a U.S. ski resort. Uh, they're, they're not like they don't price gouge as much. Um, 
And then the other passion is I, I designed my own glasses. Uh, so that was sort of a, I, it's a hobby. I wanted to make it a business, but being in startups, I know it's super hard to start up. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a hobby for now. Uh, with 3D printing, I think I've been waiting for technology so I can make stuff in small quantities on my own without the pressure of like making thousands with a manufacturer. 3D printing has come a long way. So I think it's caught up to kind of what I want to see, which is the latest 3D printers can print kind of translucent, transparent uh, uh, sort of frames that are skin safe. Um, so yeah, I'm working with a couple of guys in Germany trying to you know make that happen. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, these glasses, they're metal. We did a, a production run of like a few hundred frames, but it wasn't good enough. So I, I didn't want to sell it to people. I, yeah. They look very cool to me. I will definitely say that. Um, I did not know you made those yourself. That's fantastic. And again, for the folks uh, listening, it's just, it's just nice to, to realize that all these smart people in high level uh, positions, they have lives outside of work. You have passions and hobbies and interests. And that's why we like to have well-rounded folks like you on the podcast. Um, with that being said, um, I'm going to wrap up everything. JW, please stick around for a moment after. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining uh, Mark and I on the podcast. Um, to those of you still listening, thank you for tuning in um, to listen to JW. He's been a fantastic guest. Uh, and we'll see you guys in about a week or two with a new episode. Thank you so much, JW. Thank you. Thank you.